Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar that we're organizing uh, CIPRI, the uh, World Food Program and Food and Agriculture Organization together on the theme of from conflict and hunger to stability and nourishment, looking for a comprehensive approach to peace development and humanitarian action. My name is Dan Smith. I'm director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and we're very honored to be participating in and associated with this meeting. I'll introduce the panelists in a moment. First, let me just give you very quickly, very telegraphically, the big picture that I think that we're looking at. Over the past four or five years, the uh, picture with world hunger has gotten worse. After decades of improvement, it has started to deteriorate. And before the COVID pandemic came along, the two main drivers um, of this were violent conflict and climate change. And what is clear is that unless we address these drivers, we're not going to be able to really uh, get to grips with the, the problems of uh, world hunger, of reducing it, of turning back to that positive development we had for uh, two, three decades from 1990 onwards. We're not going to be able to address the problem of uh, increasing risk of famine, especially in conflict circumstances. And so within the context of preparing the Food System Summit in September this year, we've started to develop what is what we're calling a proto-coalition uh, on uh, the humanitarian development and peace nexus to address exactly this set of problems, the relationship between food insecurity and human insecurity, and therefore also the relationship between building food security and building peace. And to, to be discussing that, uh, now with us, we have a, a, a tremendous panel, uh, three people. Um, Habib Maya, who is the Deputy General Secretary of the G7 Plus uh, Group of Nations. Uh, Willem Oldhoff, who is the Deputy Head of Unit in the Sustainable Agri-Food Systems and Fisheries in the Directorate General for International Partnerships in the European Commission. And Muna Lukman, who is the uh, Founder and the Chair of Food for Humanity Foundation in Yemen and we'll be talking with them in a moment. Let me give you just a little bit of housekeeping first off. Interpretation is available in French and Spanish, and you can go to the bar at the bottom of the Zoom screen where it says interpretation and uh, choose the channel. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box. This is a very short session. Well, these meetings are just uh, 50, five zero minutes long. Um, so there's not going to be much time, but we will take uh, questions if we possibly can. And feel free, please, to use the chat box to share relevant information. And if you're tweeting about this event, um, we'd like you to use the hashtag uh, conflict and hunger uh, to tweet any comments about it. Um, so let me, without further ado, uh, turn to Habib Meyer, uh, Deputy General Secretary of the G7+. Plus. Um, and Habib, many members of the G7 Plus um, are either facing a grave food crisis or they're hosting large numbers of uh, refugees and asylum seekers from neighboring countries, which themselves are favoring, um, uh, facing food crisis. And I mean, worse, unfortunately, not only has the number of armed conflicts increased dramatically over the past decade, but I think unfortunately we're looking forward to a fairly bleak horizon in the 2020s unless we really manage to get to grips with uh, conflict prevention. So in today's protracted conflicts, what is the G7's approach? How can countries strengthen their national food systems and support uh, both the, lo the local populations and the forcibly displaced populations from their regions. Habib, over to you. Um, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, a very good evening, afternoon and morning, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and all the organizers for, the, um, for inviting me on behalf of the G7 Plus group uh, to share our perspective on how to transition from um, conflict and hunger to uh, stability and uh, nourishment. Uh, just for those of you uh, who don't know about the G7 Plus, um, the G7 Plus, uh, in fact, with a little g, just to avoid the confusion, 
uh, is an intergovernmental organization of 20 conflict affected countries uh, that aims at achieving uh, lasting peace um, and stability. Uh, we pursue concerted advocacy and facilitate sharing of experiences among our member countries and also with the non gsom plus countries which have had the same uh, trajectory over the past decades. Uh, we promote national dialogue and reconciliation to achieve peace and uh, new ways to engaging in uh, conflict affected uh, countries. Uh, important milestones in this regard um, include our uh, agreement and development of what we call the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States uh, and the inclusion of SDG 16 in the Agenda 2030, which we call as our uh, baby SDG. Uh, the members of G7 Plus include uh, countries that have uh, endured uh, severe food crisis, famine and hunger, uh, such as Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, uh, Central African Republic, Timor-Leste, Haiti, and etc. Almost all of the conflict-affected fragile countries are left behind on every socioeconomic uh, indicator. The long-lasting impact of COVID-19 has further slowed down their growth towards um, social well-being. Their outlook on food security is even more daunting, as you mentioned. Uh, chronic fragility, extreme poverty, hunger, malnutrition, deteriorated health system, and fragile economies are uh, their main uh, attributes that are almost every one of us is aware of. What is least spoken of these countries is their potential for stability and self-reliance. Uh, and I would like to speak about that and start with that. The potential which could be unleashed to achieve stability is unfortunately being undermined by decades of wars and crises. Uh, let me mention a few of them as an example. My own country, Afghanistan, lies on higher elevation and its mountainous terrain, mountain terrain get great amount of snow that is best source of fresh water. Due to lack of needed infrastructure, such as dams, large amount of water is wasted in front of, in form of flood and evaporation. And decades of war has, uh, of the country, in the country has undermined our capacity to, to store our water and manage them ineffectively. Yemen, which holds huge uh, reservoir of crude oil and gas, has one of the best coffee plantation and its honey is known to be the best in the world. But today, millions of its own children are exposed to the risk of severe famine. Hence, it has been on the headlines of humanitarian relief for, for years now. Somalia, it has one of the longest coastline in Africa that can be an exceptional ground for fisheries. But due to war and resultant fragility, its population suffer from, from hunger. South Sudan, in addition to being the richest in oil in the region, lies on the bank of Nile River that has the potential to, to lift the whole region out of poverty. Democratic Republic of Congo, which has underneath in it untapped mineral deposits worth more than 23 trillion US dollars. It has more available farmland than any other country in Africa with an agricultural potential to feed close to 2 billion people. Yet conflict and fragility have suffered milestones of its own people. The same applies to so many other countries that have been at the mercy of uh, humanitarian and development aid that is rarely spent in a way to unleash their potential. Now against this background, I would like to offer three points that we at the G7 Plus should be, should, think should be featured in the World Food Summit and every other form to achieve stability. First, in order to end hunger in these countries, we need to end wars there. In order for the triple nexus of peace, humanitarian and development action to work, every intervention in fragile countries should become peace oriented. It is war that has displaced millions of people around the world, has caused starvation and has undermined the potential that could otherwise bring prosperity to the people in these countries. Agreement on exploring ways to pursuing ceasefire and hence peace in these countries that are in conflict should be one of the main outcomes of this year UN Summit on Food Security. Second, hunger and food crisis in fragile countries are too big to be addressed through ad hoc, projectized and random intervention, intervention founded on the philosophy of what we call the quick fixes. Most of these countries are the major recipient of aid and yet none of them is fully self-sufficient in food production despite the rich potential as I referred to earlier. Therefore, development aid should be spent with a long-term vision of pursuing self-reliance in these countries. We need more investment in long-term vision of pursuing, uh, we need more investment in agriculture and water sector 
with the aim of tackling food prices in a more sustainable way. Third and last, recognizing the impact, the, the important role that humanitarian relief actors play in the conflict affected situations, we believe that their intervention can become even more impactful if they use national means and resources. This includes local procurement, which should provide an incentive for local food production and services. In addition, they should support the initiatives that are grounded in the context and culture of the societies they are serving. The Greenica program in Rwanda that provides a cow to every poor family to end the malnutrition is one of the best examples of how national measures can help achieve uh, stability and also end uh, hunger. Donor support for this program is more effective than and important than any other externally designed measure that are imported without keeping the context in, in consideration. One specific recommendation in this regard can be committing to increasing local procurement in the humanitarian relief. Um, and with this, I would like to conclude by, uh, by reiterating that if we sow the seed of peace, we will all harvest the abundance of living. So thank you so much for your attention. Habib, thank you so much. And thank you for the clarity of those messages. The importance of, uh, of, of, of building the peace, there's no quick fix, and the importance of the local resources and um, lo local procurement. And I think also place that within the context of understanding, of getting a better sense of what the real potential is in these countries, despite everything which, which they're going through. If I turn now to uh, Willem Althoff uh, from, the, uh, from the European Commission. Um, Wim, I mean, as we know, the EU is a major donor and a political actor in conflict affected contexts. It provides humanitarian assistance and it promotes long-term investments as well as global efforts to address food crises, like for example, the global network against food crises. Yet, as I said at the beginning, the problems are deepening and the challenges are becoming more demanding. And looking ahead, I don't see uh, any easing off of those challenges. So looking ahead, in that long-term perspective that Habib was asking for, what can the EU do to incentivize more comprehensive approaches to strengthening food systems? And what, what new propositions can, can the EU, can you bring forward? Over to you, then. Thanks, Dan, and um, good evening, good morning, good, uh, good afternoon to all who, wherever you are. Um, thanks, Dan, also for, for, for asking a very challenging question. And uh, my third thanks to you is for your introduction, in which you basically uh, gave the scene as to um, how serious the, the developments in the world are. And if we look at, um, let's say, the, uh, the global report on food crisis, um, which has been published now in the last uh, five years um, and by, by a group of, um, of actors, um, we see slowly that um, the food crises in the world are getting worse. Um, they're worsening compared to the previous years, more people facing food crisis in the world and more people on the higher side of the IPC scale, which means more people in a rather desperate situation. And increasingly conflict is the driver and um, that means that conflict is indeed if we want to solve something around um, uh, world hunger conflict is something to be addressed we know very well that these problems are deepening and that we need to act much more effectively than in the past at the european commission we have been investing quite heavily in what we call the global network against food crisis. This is a network of actors meant to be a global public good to help us all in better understanding food crises around the world and in, dress, in addressing them more effectively. Um, it mainly consists of humanitarian and development actors. It solidly rests on the support of the FAO and the WFP, but it has grown and arguably you can say over the years uh, through some, some growing pains as well. And currently involves quite a range of actors from, as I said, the humanitarian and development side. It's not perfect, but we strongly believe that it provides a good foundation from which to advance. And from that base, 
let me give you three elements which I think um, we should be pursuing in the next couple of years. First is to make sure that we continue to base ourselves on the best available information and communicate consistently around it. This is really essential for the credibility and to avoid duplication of effort. It would not help if agencies or, or whoever is involved present different numbers of people that need assistance, shorter, longer term. And um, it helps, like we've done in the global network, to, to have uh, uh, an accepted methodology uh, that everyone shares and, and can, um, can work about. Um, that doesn't mean that the methodology needs to be stagnant. Improvements are always welcome, but it does require that we work on the basis of cooperation and triangulation. That's one. My second, and that touches also on, on, on what um, Habib has just, just said, um, broadening of support for sustainable investments in fragile context. Um, the entire food systems pre-summit that we, we are going through these days shows quite clearly that the fragility of food systems is no, matter, no longer a matter just for researchers or for specialists in the field, but that all, including at the highest political level, understand that we're living in Frank, that we're having fragile food systems and that these food systems and their fragility um, can be both a cause and a, and a, a consequence of conflict. Um, there's therefore a broad common understanding on the change on the need to change paradigm and to find solutions to reverse the trends that we're that we're in and of putting into practice principles of economic, social and environmental sustainability of food systems. But the discussion thus far has not been very specific on what areas to focus on. And I would argue that a very strong case exists for, um, for a focus on fragile areas, particularly for public investments, but also through de-risking of private investments. And I would like to make reference to one of the parallel sessions this morning, um, which also um, which was about investing um, through blended finance, particularly also in in in, um, in order to build resilience in difficult uh, areas, organized by UNCDF, and uh, very interesting cases uh, came to the fore in which um, uh, on which to build as well in in, in our case. My third point is that we need to expand the cooperation between humanitarian development and peace actors. It's exactly the message, of course, of this, of this um, parallel event. We can do that through joint analysis, through information exchange, through coordination at different levels. To take one example, really the growing security situation in the Sahel must be analyzed and dealt with in conjunction with the food crisis in the area. Um, obviously, working with three different groups of actors is not easy. We've been noticing that working uh, of humanitarian and, um, and development actors together, uh, both in the field and at headquarters, uh, creates sometimes tensions and, and, and misunderstandings. So bringing in a third group um, might make things even difficult, but it's essential. Again, there's much work to build on, including to a certain extent in the global network that I referred to. And probably one of the most important ways forward is to provide a dedicated platform for these actors to come together, to learn from each other and to build trust. In conclusion, I would strongly argue that we depart from the global network against food crisis instead of developing new structures. And from the side of the European Commission, we will stand ready to continue and deepen our engagement in this respect. Finally, with respect to the protocol coalition that we're discussing on the HDP nexus, I can only welcome it as one of the valuable initiatives raised at this pre-summit. We will be happy to engage in the weeks ahead and like to see it develop into a strong initiative at the September summit. 
Thank you very much. And back to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Vim, and thank you for the for the final point and the encouragement to keep developing the, the proto coalition onto into being a, a full fledged coalition involving member states. I think the combination of the global cooperation that you uh, emphasize through the global network, the sustainable investment in fragile contacts, the context, the focus on the fragile areas and deepening the, the cooperation between the different communities of thought and practice. The emphasis on the multidisciplinary nature uh, of this enterprise is, is very welcome and, and thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned as, um, as an example, uh, the Sahel, but of course you could have taken other examples as well. And we have with us, and I'm turning now to uh, Muna Lukman uh, who, from Yemen. And um, Muna, Yemen faces and has faced for several years, one of the worst humanitarian situations in the world with over 16 million people are food insecure and over 5 million people are on the brink of famine. So you've, you've listened to somebody from the G7, you've listened to somebody from the EU. From your perspective, what needs to be done to stop the spread of famine in Yemen and, and what's missing and what's being done now? Muna Lukman, oh. over to you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I would, um, first of all, let me say that we need to, first of all, think of the underlying causes, not just the, um, uh, the symptoms. And I think that um, for Yemen, the current dramatic levels of food insecurity and the threat of famine, which actually we're already seeing, um, has been uh, um, uh, there for so many years, and it's a result of the war, but it's also Pre, uh, before the war, we also have had high levels of in food insecurity uh, existing. Uh, yet, unfortunately, this is a man-made crisis. Um, Yemen imports um, more than 90% of its food, um, and many of the inspection mechanisms um, at the ports and the destroyed infrastructure are also causing a rise in, um, in uh, food uh, prices. The continuous uh, confrontations between uh, armed groups, the attacks, um, to the civilian populations have also um, been uh, a challenge uh, to humanitarian access and operations. Um, the people in Yemen are in need, um, such as uh, what um, Habib was saying, uh, for an, an, a nationwide emergency response plan that cannot be implemented uh, or successful while the country is at war. So the first and most imperative Humanitarian, humanitarian step is ending the devastating war without delay, ending and terminating the um, land, sea, and air blockade, ending the violence on the ground, and restoring the state institutions through a comprehensive uh, peace um, process and security uh, sector reform. So these are the essential um, uh, things that uh, elements that should be um, should relieve at least some of the um, uh, the suffering. The humanitarian efforts in Yemen should continue to be funded by the international community, but with focus on the livelihoods rather than the dependency on aid and to address Yemen's economic collapse. And this is one of the drivers of the famine and support Yemen's future recovery. The international community should also aim at providing urgent support, focusing on the agriculture, fisheries, livelihood sectors, supporting fisherwomen, fishermen, farmers, um, agricultural laborers, um, and providing grants uh, to support their contributions to uh, food security. Another essential and core element, um, which is truly missing um, um, currently, is to partner with grassroots initiatives and community-based women and youth organizations and networks to maximize the impact and uh, effectiveness, particularly as they have access to remote um, areas and knowledge of the local context. Uh, unfortunately, in Yemen, we have the lack of accountability, diversion, and obstruction of aid, um, and um, that needs to have um, to establish more mon monitoring uh, mechanisms. The humanitarian aid system in general in Yemen needs to be restructured uh, to have more effective um, uh, delivery of aid um, and to ensure an, uh, an appropriate, effective, and sustainable response in Yemen we need to enhance the role of civil society, engaged community, in, including the private sector, in committees and programs, um, and channel women's voices and have a 
a holistic approach that has a gendered um, um, approach to it and angle. Multi-stakeholder collaboration um, is uh, important. And we've seen this during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, where there was a multi-stakeholder collaboration and it really um, uh, helped to recover and build more sustainable and resilient um, uh, communities. Uh, but we need more of that because the failure to work together has led to gaps in coverage and duplications and inefficiencies. Uh, in conclusion, um, access to safe, dignified livelihoods mitigates the risk of exploitation and abuse and reduces violence. Hunger um, leads to community violence, and we are seeing that this is feeding the conflict in Yemen. Uh, and also, um, it's providing a breeding area for extremists who take the advantage of the vulnerability of the people in need. For increased efficiency, we need to bridge between the multilateral, bilateral, national government and local level uh, action. But to be practical, no amount of it can offset the economic collapse, spiking food prices and war economy that conflicts uh, produce. Only sustainable and comprehensive peace process can, um, can, can achieve stability and development, but we should at least set the scene to prevent hunger and cycles of violence. And that has to be a people's and community-based approach. Thank you. Muna, thank you so, so very much. Um, it is both painful and inspiring to, to listen to you. Um, painful, obviously, because of the tragedy which you're, you're reporting on, which is, a, you know, enormous but also inspiring because i think that you get into the the different dimensions and the different levels of action which are required we're talking about of course a comprehensive peace settlement but that's not a comprehensive it's not comprehensive it's not peace and it's not a settlement unless it has the engagement not just from the international level and not just from national elites, but from the local and the community level as well. And I think you're, you're right that one expects to find a lot of energy and drive for that um, amongst women's groups and youth groups in, in, in particular. Um, we have a, a question that has, has come up in the Q&A box. So the importance of um, seeking sustainable food systems in uh, conflict affected areas in the in the hotspots um, and would that help address the crises and contribute to preventing future crises and i want to to address this question actually i want to turn um if i may to rain paulson who is the um i think um quite new director in the offices office of emergencies and uh, resilience at the food and agriculture organization at fao i mean Ren, obviously food, well, agriculture has a very important role to play in our societies and even in conflict situations, perhaps more than, 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 than any other time. What do you see as being the key challenges and the key way forward? Over, over to you, Ren. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a few quick reflections and some of these, in fact, I think will pick up Nicely on comments the panelists have, uh, have just made, not, not least comments that uh, uh, Mona was just making. So uh, we estimate that eight out of 10 people live in uh, acute food insecurity. Those that live in acute food insecurity rely on some form of agriculture for their survival. And I think it's important to understand that particularly then in situations of conflict and violence, the role of agriculture becomes even more critical as communities often have few alternatives outside of themselves to um, um, uh, to be able to uh, survive in those types of settings. And indeed, our experience, FAO's experience is that, you know, even in the midst of violent conflict, especially in the midst of violent conflict, farmers are doing their utmost to protect their livelihoods assets, to care for their livestock, to access their fields. Um, we've seen uh, images, we've seen firsthand, unfortunately, in too many contexts, um, uh, people displaced from violence, fleeing with their animals, desperate to keep them alive, both as a source of uh, food, but also as a, as a source of income. So this, this reality, I think, is key. And so supporting um, these communities to safeguard their livelihoods uh, assets and, and to be able to keep producing nutritious food, especially in uh, situations of conflict and violence, is, is vital. And I think Muna was uh, arguing strongly on, you know, the critical need for this 
livelihoods uh, emphasis. I think it's also important to recognize the role that context appropriate agriculture, support to agriculture can play to contribute indeed to peace at, at local levels. And we know that the sector tends to recover fast when, when there is some stability and when it uh, when it returns. So uh, vital on all sorts of levels. You've asked this question around what the key challenges uh, are. I mean, a, a few quick reflections here. I think investments in emergency livelihoods assistance, we know have a substantial impact at the household level themselves. They also, uh, I think importantly, have a significant impact on reducing uh, uh, reducing the levels of need and, and uh, um, mitigating against future crisis. You know, we estimate in FAO that um, when we were looking at the six countries that were the focus of the call to action of the high-level task force to prevent famine, five of which, of course, are characterized by conflict and violence, uh, we were looking at about $600 million focused on agriculture to work in those settings. We estimated as FAO that with those $600 million, families at risk of famine would have produced crops alone worth some $4 billion. So uh, very important. But to achieve that, Agriculture needs to be adequately resourced and resourced at the right time. And currently, as we see the analysis over the last five years, the agriculture sector receives on average less than 10% of the resources going into the sector. So really, in summary, I mean, agriculture has this primordial role to play in reducing acute hunger and conflict situations elsewhere as well. But we're talking about conflict situations here. Furthermore, we know what anticipatory actions make sense. We know what type of effective a response actions can have the greatest uh, impact. But to achieve that, we need to, uh, agriculture to be sufficiently resourced at the right points in time during the agriculture calendar year and programmed in a context aware manner in order for it to realize uh, all of those benefits in favor of these vulnerable households living in acute food insecurity. A lot to be said, but just in summary, Dan, if I could, those few thoughts. Back to you. Rain, thank you very much, both for the breadth of the thoughts and for, for, for being so succinct. We're hurtling along through this uh, webinar, conscious as uh, panelists all the time of, the, of the, the time pressure on us. And I want now to turn to each of the three panelists in turn. I think the best thing to do is in the order in which you spoke. So it would be Habib first and then, and then Muna. And Apart from any reflection that you might have within a kind of a two minute span, that's all that can be allowed. Apart from any reflection that you might have on what you have each been saying and what you've heard from, from Rain, what especially do you think about one of the things we've heard quite a lot, I think from everybody, which is about the, the need for cooperation between the different constituencies between the different disciplines, if you like, of thinking humanitarian, development, peace, and as well as, of course, the, 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 the natural environment, the issue of climate change. So your own, your own thoughts, and if at all possible, a response on that question of uh, the interdisciplinarity. Uh, Habib, you first. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let, let's, uh, I think, and it was also agreed by the other panelists as well that, um, the humanitarian development and peace uh, all go hand in hand. Um, and I think two points were, which, are, which were reflected here and I would like to emphasize on that. First um, is the crisis or the conflict over land management. Uh, it's common in every country, I'm sure, uh, but a country with stable and resilient institutions, those conflicts and crises are managed peacefully uh, through you know, a, a kind of regulatory framework. But in countries which are conflict affected, those institutions are too fragile. And that's why they cannot reach out to solve those resolute or to, to resolve those conflicts peacefully. And that's why we experience conflicts at the local level. And some in my own country, such conflicts have gone for decades, you know, between among or among families. And the second point is uh, reaching out to the local people. I think that's very important. Sometimes we we have witnessed that, you know, we spend a lot of money which does which which fails to reach those uh, people at the grassroots level for example the farmers you know they they need support with uh, with with water management uh, they need support with uh, storage of you know the food production and they need sub support with you know education or maybe training so i think that those are some some important points and i think if the nexus has to work we all have to work in a harmonized way 
um, you know, and, and I, I, I don't want to repeat what I said before, um, it all go in hand in hand. And I would say that if, you know, if we have, um, if we have peace, our institutions will become more stable and, and capable of resolving these uh, crises, you know, more effectively and, and peacefully. Thank you. Thanks very much, Habib. And I think just to emphasize one point you made in there, which we often don't think nearly enough about because we, you know, we persistently we're looking at headlines and the big international stories, is that in, in an awful lot of cases, I mean, I know that this is true in Yemen, for example, as well, there is, a, it's like an undergrowth of armed conflicts, violent conflicts that were too small to be thinking about as far as the international community was concerned, but which are part of the unfortunately, the ecosystem of violence and conflict in these conflict affected countries. And it's been mentioned as well in the chat about the case of, uh, of, of Nigeria and so on. There are several, many, unfortunately, too many such cases. Vim, over to you with the, the, the double task. Um, your thoughts and if possible, something on interdisciplinarity as well. Good. Let me start with the interdisciplinarity then, uh, and uh, basically saying what I what I said in my earlier introduction that it it's an absolute necessity. The the entire three days the food system summit show that we have to work in an interdisciplinary way when we talk about food systems, but when we extend it to food and conflict, we even have to go beyond. And um, this. Um, as I said before, brings together a couple of people with different entry points. Um, myself, I'm coming from the development um, side, never trained on anything related to, to conflict. Uh, what kind of in interventions do you do? Uh, is, it, is it conflict enhancing, yes or no? Um, this, of course, in the course of, the, of time, um, we, we started to open our eyes and to, to work with, with others. And um, this, uh, but this is not without this challenge. And uh, uh, so although it's a necessity, um, we have to take into account that there will be growing pains again. Um, then some of the, the reactions to, to what we've said earlier. Um, first of all, I would like to, to support really what, what Habib said as well on, on, uh, sub, on, on um, local, um, stimulating local economies in, in all possible ways. Um, he said he made reference to local purchase uh, from, from the, in, in humanitarian uh, assistance. In the EU side, we, we've tried to do that for, for a long time and, and we are a very strong uh, supporter of that. Um, we think it can be done even, even stronger. Um, also, whenever you do, let's say, um, uh, provide support in, in terms of uh, earmarked support to, to, to refugees, to, to people in crisis, um, do trust them, do provide them with, uh, with, with uh, support that is not just um, paternalistic in that sense. So that's another point. Uh, final point is um, I, I do agree that investing in stable rural areas is one of the best ways of avoiding conflict. And we have to somehow recognize that these investments pay off in the long term. Um, that is a message that we should be repeating and researching and bringing up to the high levels. Um, and um, I hope that um, this protocol coalition will help do that. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Vim. And I, I completely agree with your final point. We really have to understand um, the long-term effects of what of what we do. Um, so, Mona, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I really don't have a lot to recap, but I just wanted to bring in the gendered aspect of this also. Um, as we've seen, in, like, for instance, in Yemen. Um, the, the, the women in Yemen are working uh, hard on so many issues, uh, such as releasing detainees um, on the rural side, um, uh, providing um, uh, small economic projects for those who have uh, been displaced from their, um, uh, their uh, houses or, um, uh, and providing livelihoods also small scale. But what we see, even in Yemen or in uh, other countries also, is that the women are always the first responders. They're always the first ones to be at the front lines, providing and um, uh, supporting the families. But they're always the ones who are underfunded, uh, they're not recognized, and they're not protected. Um, this is um, imperative for, for any um, future uh, real 
any uh, improvement in any way, but uh, if we're really thinking about uh, taking action. Uh, the same actions will only bring us the, the same results and avoiding the conflicts, avoiding the underlining causes will only um, uh, result in more cycles um, of, of violence. So I just wanted to recap on the importance of inclusivity, not just the women, the youth also, and uh, marginalized groups. They are um, essential for any uh, real impact, uh, which is uh, effective. But the approach that we're seeing right now is coming into the country um, outside in, and it should be a bottom up approach um, for dealing uh, with these um, issues. Thank you. Mona, thank you so much. I, I think, um, again, you, you get to the, to, the, to the core of the points and uh, thank you so much for your, for your contribution. We're getting towards um, the, the closing moments now. I want to, first of all, to ask um, Valerie Garnieri, the Assistant Executive Director of the World Food Programme, to come in now and to share her reflections on this, uh, this webinar so far, this set of issues that we're addressing, that the uh, Proto-Coalition on the HDP Nexus is taking up and pushing forward. Um, Valerie, over to you. Well, thank you, Dan. And, and I really wanna thank all of the panelists whose interventions have helped to illustrate the importance of understanding these linkages between conflict and food systems and how central our understanding of root causes is to our efforts to strengthen food systems resilience and ultimately to contribute to, to peace. They've also all provided key insights from their different perspectives into the importance of undertaking these efforts collaboratively, working with partners across the humanitarian development and peace domains to enhance our collective impact. Dan, you started out highlighting how, um, how, how conflict is really driving the hunger numbers up. And, and as we've heard, conflict continues to be the primary driver of food insecurity. In eight out of 10 of the world's main food crises, conflict and insecurity are the key drivers of acute hunger. And about 60% of the nearly 700 million hungry people live in countries affected by, by, by conflict. And, and this means that at the end of the day, most humanitarian assistance and two thirds of WFP's food assistance goes to people facing severe food crisis, most of them caused by, by conflict. So when you take this into account, the Food Systems Summit and food systems transformation can only be successful if we work to address the, the issues around the rising acute hunger driven by conflict and the impact and, and role of food systems in that regard. Without peace and stability, as many have highlighted, we can't hope to end hunger. And, and this is absolutely integral also to ensuring the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2417. We need to move though from merely reacting to the consequences to understanding and addressing the drivers, working to prevent and mitigate vulnerabilities to future shocks, conflict, and other instability. And in turn, we need to be maximizing the impact of our respective operations. Humanitarian development and peace actors need to be working in order to further scale up our efforts to collaborate more effectively. The Food Systems Summit is really a key opportunity for this, to capitalize and build on the progress that we are making and, and have already made. We're very pleased to see the broad interest by member states, operational actors, and civil society to engage in the emerging proto coalition on the HDP nexus and the range of promising solutions that have been put forward for discussion and further elaboration. We see this broad engagement as a very promising sign and really hope that we can use the Food Systems Summit as a springboard for further scaling up what works and to increasing and strengthening both collaboration and as Willem highlighted, the investment in these fragile contexts going forward. Thanks, Dan. Valerie, thank you. Um, clear and energetic and forward-looking as always. And I think that's what we have to be. We are facing really severe crises on a global scale. And uh, we, we need to be looking ahead. I want to take something that Muna said and um, just focus our thoughts on that for, for, for just a second. 
The same actions will produce the same results. If we want new results, we've got to do something new. We've either got to do things we're already doing better or, and or we need to actually innovate and bring new ways in. I think that the clear message coming out from everybody who's been speaking in this, in this webinar is that if we do not address conflict and if we do not manage to, in some sense, resolve the problems of, of peace in these different environments that we're talking about, then we will not ultimately make progress. We may do some fantastic and extraordinary humanitarian work, but we may have to go on doing it. And surely that is the point, is to try to get, get to a stage where these crises do not last for a decade or two decades and move on from being critical situations to being, to being chronic. And I think that panelists have, and you Valerie also, have put forward a number of the ingredients of, of the recipe that, that we need. We need, amongst other things, a local focus. We heard this so many times, local procurement, investment in localities, emphasis on agriculture within the localities and local involvement in the peace process. And also, I think it's also clear has come, come through the importance of specific and localized understanding of what has happened. There's a conference, no, sorry, there's a question in the Q&A box, which is asking about what concrete actions can be advised to stop violence? And it's a really important question. But I, sitting here in Stockholm, will not answer the question about what in Yemen or what in Somalia or what in Democratic Republic of Congo or in Burkina Faso or in parts of Nigeria, what those concrete actions are. Because in different places, they are different. We need that specific knowledge. We need very localized action, very local knowledge to understand how best to address uh, these, these questions. At the same time, we've been emphasizing the interdisciplinarity, uh, the humanitarian development and peace, each of which is, by the way, in itself an interdisciplinary field. But those three fields have to come together. And the cooperation can sometimes be complex, but when it works, it is also energizing and, and, and inspiring. At the same time as being multidisciplinary, we need to be multi-level. Um, Mona was talking about inclusivity at the local and the national level, and we need to talk about the integration between the, the local and national levels and the, the global level of, of action. And part of what our proto-coalition on the HTP Nexus, which we've been developing together, uh, CIPRI, World Food Programme and, uh, and FAO, and many other actors getting engaged now, we're really uh, infused by the, by the interest of member states, is to think about the relationship between the local platforms that are required and the global platform that is required in order to make this um, a success. And I think that as um, Habib said, you know, if the humanitarian development and peace components do not walk together hand in hand, they're not really walking together at all. So I'm looking forward to a successful food system summit in which the issues of conflict and peace receive the priority and the profile that they, uh, that they deserve. Thank you very much to everybody who has participated. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to those who put the, this webinar together. Thank you to the uh, participants who have attended. And please, a special word of thanks. Keep a place in your hearts for the interpreters uh, who make much of this international connection possible. Thank you very much to all of you and whichever time zone you're in, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and etc. Thanks a lot and goodbye everybody. <laughs>